Well, hi there, and welcome to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. I'm Alan McDaniel, and I want to welcome you on behalf of myself and everybody that's a part of the Bible Talk ministry. We are blessed that you can join us for this time in the Word of God. We're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. This is the 16th part of that study, and we'll be starting in chapter 5, verse 17, as we, as we begin. But we'll begin right after I do this. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can come together in your word, that we can meet, that we can gather, even electronically, Lord God. But the focus of our time together is your son, Christ Jesus, who is indeed the word made flesh, who dwelt among us. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have sent into us, that we might have that spirit of truth, that we might grow in the knowledge of our son, your son, Christ Jesus, that we might grow in our knowledge of you through the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We praise you and thank you for all that you've done in our lives, for all that you're doing in our lives, and for all that you are yet to do in our lives. Amen. All right, as I said, we're starting off in chapter, we're going to start in chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 17, but I want to say this first. This part of our study is, uh, we're going to take a good, serious look at knowing, understanding, and doing the will of God and its connection to family life and the household of God. Those two things are absolutely intertwined and dependent on each other. So bear that in mind. You'll see as we go along where that, where that happens. All right, so Ephesians 5, 17, and just for you, I'm, I'm reading typically from the New American Standard Bible. I use the King James, the ESV, the New American Standard. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, the will of the Lord. We cannot walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, without knowing what the Lord desires of us. And the key word is desire, because that's where the tension lies. The conflict will always be about the things that God desires and the things that you and I desire. We got to make sure that those things line up, all right? Let me just tell you the genesis of sin found in the book of Genesis. That's logical. In Genesis 3, 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Think, consider those words. Delight, King James says, pleasant and desirable. Is it possible that our desires and the things that delight us are not the same as those that God delights in and desires? Is that a possibility? It's not only possible, it is probable and virtually inevitable. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty, who is not lying, does not change, said this through the prophet Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your, uh, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So if his ways, his thoughts are different than ours, higher than, they're not going to jive. Well, you know, that's probably an excellent reason to keep in mind this when you're trying to know the will of God. Remember that we are commanded, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. Otherwise, you're going to figure out what you think God desires rather than seeking God to know what he desires. Is that true? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tread on thin ice here, especially at election time. When I see half the Christians vote for this guy and half the Christians vote for that guy and they both think that they're doing the will of God. Hello. You know, in the United States of America, I'm going to say this and I say it prayerfully. In the United States of America, it is legal to have a right in battle. So you may want to consider all of the candidates and then write in the name of Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, to be our president. I'm getting strange looks here in the room. Well, you got to see 
it was it was it was uh, announced today or yesterday, March third. That's when it was that Putin has made a, made an effort to change the constitution of Russia. What he wants to do is add into the constitution an amendment that states that marriage is a union between a man and a woman because he wants to rule out homosexual marriage. And he also wants it to include a proclamation of Russia's faith in God. That was in the BBC News. Uh, you may not get that from any of the candidates here in the United States. Uh, am I being facetious? Only a little because I don't swim in that cesspool. But anyhow, I'm about to keep on going. So before I go any further, I know that we've been given the mind of Christ. And therefore, we should think like him. Remember? And he said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. Jesus said, I didn't come here to do my own will. He said, I came to do my father's will. Believe it or not, actually believe it, because it's the word. Even Jesus, who is truly man and truly God, could have a desire unlike the Father's. Does that sound possible? Does it sound reasonable? Well, as he went off with Peter, James, and John on the way to the cross, I mean, on the night he was taken, and he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, right? He said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond, beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 38 to 39. You get that? His will, his desire, was to avoid the absolute horror of the cross if it were possible. But he chose to deny himself and do the Father's will. Remember, it says in Philippians 2.8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So I want to consider for a moment those, those three things, delight, desire, and denial. So as we seek understanding, I'm going to start with these words of Jesus. Mark 8. He summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What do you think it means to deny yourself? It means to deny your desires. And he said, you can't, you can't follow him. You can't be his disciple unless you're willing to deny yourself. And as I said at the start, the conflict will always be about the things God desires and the things that you and I desire. They're just, they're just not, not the same. Not at this point, anyhow. Praise God. I, I pray that because we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we're becoming more and more to operate in the mind of Christ. But if Jesus had to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, you had better be prepared to do the same. Satan has no power or authority over the believer. None whatsoever. He has no power or authority. He can only try to influence our desires. I mean, stop and think about that. He's the minister of propaganda for everything that's evil in the world. The propaganda of the world, and that's the wiles, the schemes of the devil, the wiles of the enemy. And it even shows up in the building and congregations of, of churches. Remember, the father of lies also has no creative power. He, hasn't, he doesn't have the ability to bring something into existence out of nothing. He can only take something that's there and pervert it, corrupt it. Every lie is a truth that's been perverted. Consider it. So with the massive move to make churches, the, the church, attractive to people, which is quite in contrast to God's plan, I mean, go read Isaiah 53 too. The prosperity message has taken hold and it's like a roaring wildfire. Have you ever heard anybody say, God wants you rich? 
I mean, that's a teaching in a lot of churches today. God wants you rich. That old serpent tried that very thing with Jesus. Remember, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And it says in Matthew 4, 8 and 10, 4, chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So it's no surprise that this particular verse I'm about to read has become so popular in the church today. I'm going to read Psalm, okay, 37, verse 4. But you better hear the whole thing before you quit, all right? Because that says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's great for pictures, plaques, coffee cups, and Christian bookstores. I mean, that, that's everybody wants the desire of their hearts. Don't you think that's a fair statement? You want the desire of your heart? Well, being the word, that's absolutely true. I mean, that's what it said. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he's going to give you the desire of your heart. But that's taken out of context with no understanding of God's will. It will become a lie. So let's add God's context and his will to it, right? Listen to this instruction in the word, from the word, on how to learn to delight yourself in the Lord. In Job chapter 22, it says, please receive instruction from his mouth and establish his words in your heart. That's a good thing. Eh? If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Throw your gold away, your silver away. And take the riches of God. Is okay. And then, of course, there's also this. In Isaiah 58, it says, If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of the light, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Deny yourself. You know what Jesus said? Deny yourself. If you stop seeking the riches of the world and store up your treasures in heaven, as Jesus commanded. If you desist from your own ways. If you stop seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word. Then you will delight in the Lord. And then, faithful to his word, Stand by now. He will give you the desire of your heart because he will become the desire of your heart. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. That's Psalm 73, 25. That has to be the desire that we, of what we want to get to. That's the only thing that really draws us. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have things here on earth, but they have to serve the kingdom. They have to serve God. They're not there to serve you. Better than cars or homes or riches, riches are the at the appropriate time, you will certainly hear these words. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, 23. Doing the will of the Lord should delight you. That's what should delight you. That's what should give you pleasure greater than anything. I mean, we could go on and on and on about this, because think about it. There's so much in here. It's certainly worth your while to go do a study about through the scriptures on, on the, the will of the Lord. How is your prayer life? You have a good, powerful, effective prayer life? Because the Word of God says, I think it's John says, if we, we know that if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us and it gets done. So if your prayer life is not great, maybe it's because you're not praying according to the will of God. And if you're not praying according to the will of God and he gives you what you're asking for, oy, 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 that's not a good thing. 
Okay, so I mean, there's just so much I can't even begin to tell you. It's it's up to you. All right. I, this is this Bible study. I, I pray is an encouragement for you to get into the Word of God and seek God. Well, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the power to find the truth. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, ask. Ask. If you are a saved child of God, ask God. He will give you the Holy Spirit. Go read the ends of the Sermon on the Mount, where where Jesus said, "How much more will you find?" You ask for. The, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. Because it's his desire, it's his will that you have the Holy Spirit. Remember, he told the saints before they went, when he left, ascended into heaven. He said, don't you leave here until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You need the Holy Spirit because he will lead you into all truth. And that all truth includes knowing the will of the Father. Knowing and having the power to follow in the footsteps, the example of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that will change your life. That's the thing that will bring you where you to the place where you can say like the Apostle Paul did, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That's what you want to be. And it's not about stuff. It's about your relationship with God the Father. Doing the will of the Lord absolutely should delight you. Now I'm just going to go on. Ephesians 5. We're going to read verses 18 and 20. Do not get drunk with wine. For that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even God the Father. Always giving thanks for all things. If you want to walk in the will of God, if you want to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ, you need to start doing that. Because remember now, Jesus, when he was preparing to do the ultimate will of the Father on earth, facing the horror of the cross, right? In submission to his Father, he was about to head out and go to the cross and offer up his own life. It says, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it unto them, the disciples, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's Luke twenty two nineteen. He gave thanks, saying here, my body is about to be broken. This is my body. And he gave thanks. But let me go back to God's will. And this is something you really need to know. I, I pray that God will burn some of these things into your mind, your heart, your spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I mean, I, you know, when I was pastoring churches and people would come up to me, saints in the, in the church, and they'd have a situation that they'd say, I don't, know, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I'd say, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Start giving thanks. Start praising the Lord. That's God's will for you. And when you start walking in God's will, you start walking in victory. If we proclaim the good confession, you know, Paul talked about the good confession when he wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy. And, and uh, remember, starting this fifth chapter, we talk about being imitators, followers of Christ. So Paul wrote to his son in the faith and said, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, who testified of all things and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. The good confession, it's what Jesus testified before Pontius Pilate. Now, you couldn't be in a worse situation than Jesus was. And Jesus knew exactly what situation he was in, right? Pilate is, has Jesus on trial. And Jesus is apparently not shaken up, not shaken, knowing that he faces Pontius Pilate, who has power. What did Pilate say to him? You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. John 19, 10 and 11. Our God, our Father, who loves us so much he, that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die in our place. Our Father is in control. And his son, Jesus, is faithful and true. You and I are safe in the palm of his hand. You should be giving thanks. 
You need to be giving thanks, no matter what the situation looks like. That's the good confession. That is an expression of your faith. That is an expression expression of your trust in him. That is an expression in your trust of his will that he desires that none should perish but ever come to everlasting life. You're trusting in his will because he sent Christ to die on that cross for you that you would spend eternity in heaven with him. That's God's will. When all is said and done, God's will is that none should perish but all come to everlasting life. That's, the, that's what Jesus paid that horrible price for. I mean, Paul got that, and that changed Paul, and Paul changed the world. Our God, our Father, who loves us so much, he gave Jesus to die in our place. That's what, go read Romans 8 and see that you get that. Our Father is in control. Nothing goes on in your life that God doesn't allow, permit, or cause. Now, like I said at the start, and everything that we've just looked at testifies to this. The fact that the Father's will is not about religion. Well, I believe in visiting orphans and widows and keeping oneself unstained from the world is what religion is, according to the Word of God in James. But it's about a relationship. It's about a family affair. Religion, everything that Jesus has done, everything that God the Father sent him to do, was all about restoring our relationship with God the Father. So I said when we started, we're going, to have a, we're going to have a look at the Father's will, not about religion, right? But about that family affair, a family life in the house of God. So for the next 20 some odd verses here in, 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 and in chapter six, we're going to be looking at family life in the household of God. And it surely will be about the will of the Father. Take time to consider this. You know, Jesus was teaching. And while he was speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside. They wanted to speak to him. So someone said to him, to Jesus, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. If you're doing the will of God, you are part of the family of God. Listen to me now. If you're not doing the will of God, I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how many times you go to church, how much you tithe. You're not part of the family of God. But there's a simple answer. Turn to God, repent, cry out to him. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what it says in Romans 8. You know, when I got saved, now I had been raised in a, in a well, I'm just going to, I was raised a Roman Catholic. I went through all Roman, I went through Catholic schools from, from grammar school, from first grade up through college prep, a boys college prep. Um, so I had been trained well in religion. I really didn't know anything about the Lord, quite frankly. I didn't have a, I don't, I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Although many times, or quite a number of times, I felt him pulling on the heartstrings of me to get my attention, which, praise God, he did. But the fact is, when I got saved, and I got very saved, and I got saved at my kitchen table, and when I did, my life changed completely, absolutely, and totally. Boom, just like that. Now, that didn't mean I knew everything about the Bible. It didn't mean I knew everything about God's will. But the fact was, I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, at the time, I, I was the president of a small full-service advertising agency. So, you know the old song, I think B.J. Thomas sang the addition that I like, what a difference you've made in my life. The fact is, that made a difference in my life. My life changed instantly and totally when I got saved. So people noticed. You know, like the story of the man who was born blind and he all of a sudden he could see? Everybody in town is talking about who is, what happened. Well, 
The fact is, I knew what happened. Jesus happened. That's what happened to me. Jesus happened to me. So people were asking me, this is back in the mid 70s, at a time when there was a charismatic renewal. And so people were asking me, you know, what happened to you? What happened? You've changed. You are you are you not one of those? Are you born again Christian? Are you? And the fact is, I didn't know. Like I said, I, I knew who it happened to me, but I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what I was. I was different, but I didn't know what I was. And it was such a serious thing. I mean, I had clients asking me. I had vendors asking me. I had everybody that knew me was asking me, what happened to you? So I told Alice, I'm going to go away for a few days and I'm going to pray. And I went away and I sought the Lord. And I said, Lord, what am I? What, am I a born-again Christian? Am I a, a charismatic? What, what am I? And this is exactly what he told me. He said, you're my child. The Spirit of God bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. He will not bear witness that you're a Baptist, a Pentecostal, or any other thing, because in Christ Jesus, those things don't exist. There's neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew. You're either a child of God or you're not. It's that simple. And if you are a child of God, it should be your great desire to please your Father. And the way you can be instructed to please your Father in heaven is to follow the example of your big brother, Jesus Christ. That's the plan, and it works. Well, I think I'm going to cut it off here, but I want to tell you that we're going to come back next week because the next verses here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians starts to talk about the relationships within the household, husband and wife, husband, wife, and children. I mean, it goes right down the line. God has a plan. He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You don't have to lean on your own understanding. As a matter of fact, God says, don't you do that. But whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. God has a plan to teach you what you should be living like in these days, in these perilous last days. So if you come back again next week and join us once again, we're going to go into that. In the meantime, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to talk to us about, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Until then, may the Lord our God bless you, use you for the glory of his name. In Jesus' name I ask that. Amen and amen. God bless you and goodbye. Bye.